Hello. Oh, yes. <laughs> I, I'm pretty loud. I could probably do it without a mic sometimes, but there's quite a way back there. So, yeah. Hey, thank you so much. Me and Sarah have really enjoyed getting to know you, and how warm and welcoming you are is fantastic. So that's a key thing for us. And thank you so much. I've really, really enjoyed that. Um, and especially for you guys, Denise and Robert, it's been, we felt, it's felt like home. So thank you so much. We've really enjoyed our time with you as well. So, so this morning, I would like to share one of, can you say a favorite psalm? A psalm that's kind of impacted me from when I was quite young and I've thought about a lot over the years. Um, and yeah, Psalm 42. So we're going to have a look at Psalm 42 and then look more about what it means to desire God so if you've got your Bibles or electronic paper, or we'll be up there, um, let's read this together. Actually, I might just, just while you're finding your Bibles, I might, or I might just pray as we begin this morning. Yeah, Jesus, we love you. We thank you so much that you um, came into each of our lives if we know you, and you set us free, and you gave us the, the deepest desire of our heart, which is relationship with you, and you... You, um, yeah, you'll never leave us or forsake us. You're always there. And I pray this morning as we look at the psalm, as we look at your word, that you would stir up a fresh hunger and desire for you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Psalm 42, verse 1. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night. While people say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the mighty one. With shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Saviour and my God. My soul is downcast within me, therefore I will remember you. From the land of Jordan, the heights of Hermon, from Mount Mazar, deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. By day the Lord directs his love. At night his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, where is your God? Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Saviour and my God. So the psalmist who wrote Psalm 42, he probably also wrote Psalm 43. They had a holy desire for God. Um, and in Psalm 42, we learn that he, the, the, the psalmist was unable to go to Jerusalem and meet with God and, his, and experience his presence in the temple. We also see that he had many enemies and difficulties that further prevented him from, from returning to Jerusalem. And also, what's fascinating about this psalm is the way it's written. It's not written so much as a prayer to God, um, but the psalmist is instead di talking directly to his own soul. Does anyone ever talk to themselves? Anyone ever do that? I talk to my, my cats. I'm always talking to them rather than to myself because that feels... Um, Sarah's always laughing at me because I talk to the cats. But yeah, if we, so this is what the psalmist is doing, not talking to his cats, but talking to his own soul. He's talking um, and, and speaking to his soul and encouraging himself despite all this. We, yeah, so... He's in, what is it encouraging himself to do? Well, he's encouraging himself not to be discouraged, but to put his hope in God and praise God despite his circumstances. Now, I don't know about you, but I've had many ups and downs in my spiritual journey, um, and I've had times when I've been discouraged. Anyone else had a time in their Christian life where they're discouraged? No, I see heads nodding, I see some hands, so yes, we've all had those, almost, I think, pretty much 100% have had those times. Right, in our spiritual journey, when it's been, it's taken um, some self-talk or it's taken some grit to get through and not stay discouraged. So the Christian life 
as a journey. And it's during the tough times that we can feel at times that God isn't there. We can feel his absence um, and feel like God has left us. Furthermore, what can happen sometimes in those times that our earlier zeal and passion for God can wane and we can drift from having this vital relationship with the Lord. We can still be going to church, we can still kind of be going through the motions, but that discouragement can really eat at our vitality and our living relationship with the Lord. Um, But in this psalm, it's fascinating. The psalmist doesn't let this difficulty of not bound to go and meet with God, which for the Old Testament saints was God's presence was in Jerusalem. He doesn't let this discouragement and opposition affect his spiritual life. He actually uses his memories of the times that he experienced God's presence in Jerusalem, in the temple, um, to shift his focus and stir his desire afresh for God. And through this kind of self-talk to his soul, it leads him to seek God and to praise God. And so this morning I'd like to do the same. As we, as we look at this psalm, as we think about desiring God, I'd like you to think about your spiritual journey, if you can, while I'm talking. Maybe hard, but if you can. Um, and think about times when you felt the joy of God's presence, where you felt just the, um, that you're experiencing a, a closeness and intimacy with Him and a strong desire for Him. And then as we go this morning, we'll start to turn our eyes afresh to God, away from the discouragement, away from the difficulties, um, and turn our eyes to God, who is the deepest desire of our hearts. As the psalmist put it, when we strip everything else away, we actually have a deep desire for God. As he said, as a deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. Now, desire, passion, we, we can use these words a lot, but what do, we, what do we actually mean by this? Well, all of us have a passion for things, um, whether it be a hobby, whether it be our work. Um, when I was growing up, I really wanted to understand the universe and how it works. I really wanted to understand the meaning of life. And I found the answer wasn't 42, like Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy told me in a science fiction book, movie. Um, No, it wasn't. Um, But I I thought science, you know, I was told, especially when I was kind of a, before I was a teenager, teenager, that science would solve all our problems. You know, the year 2000, we're going to be in flying cars. Anyone in the 80s going like, yeah, flying cars, underwater cities, it's going to be so cool. And then I remember driving down Colombo Street on New Year's Eve in the year 2000 going, Nothing's changed. It's just the same city. We've got the internet, whoop de doop de at that time. It's got better for sure, but like, I was quite disappointed in science. But when I was young, I just was passionate about science. When I was a primary school kid, I was such a nerd. My friends called me boffin. Probably that term's out of circulation, just means scientist. Because I was like trying to understand atoms, and I thought if I understood you know, atoms and subatomic particles, then I'd understand the universe, right? And went on to do, obviously... Um, a career in science in terms of electrical engineering. But later on, I came quite disillusioned with science because science can show us a lot of the how, but not necessarily the why. So another passion of mine was to understand who God is. Um, and that started when I was reasonably young as well. And reading a book by, by a theologian called J.O. Packer's Knowing God. Anyone ever read that book? A very cool book. Um, that got me excited to think, wow, we can know, we can know God. We can know this infinite creator of everything, and we can know um, more about him. And yeah, that kind of grew, especially when I was younger, a kind of a desire to know more than just science, but to know God and to know myself and to know how we are wired and why, and what is the meaning? Why are we here? What is the meaning of life? So so I was basically a little nerd um, growing up and continued to be so. Um, So now I want to look at where does this desire, um, this desire for God, where it comes from, where it starts and where it comes from. So let's have a look at that for a little bit. So where does this desire come from? And to answer that question, we need to look at how God has designed us. Now, the wind, um, now one of the fascinating things through church history is a whole lot of um, increasingly woman, but it was originally a whole of men, we get together and try and figure out these big statements that explain what it's all about. 
a lot of theologians will get together. And one of them is the Westminster Confession of 1647. And it asks and answers the question this way. What is the chief end of man or human beings? What is the chief end of man? Man or human's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. From all their study of the Word and understanding who God is, who we are, how we're saved, what happens at the end, everything, the Bible is saying, that's how they summarize it. I'll read that again. Man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. So that's what we've been actually designed to. We've been designed to actually glorify God and enjoy Him forever. So it's clear throughout the Bible that that's what we've ultimately been created for, is an intimate relationship with God and each other, but our relationship with God is actually primary. And as a result of this, our deepest desire is for God, but that desire, like all our desires, has been distorted by the fall. When Adam and Eve fell, unfortunately that's been passed on to all of us. Um, now, as human beings, we are actually a bundle of desires. Have you ever thought about that? <coughs> Sounds interesting, doesn't it? But we're a bundle of desires. Um, what are some of these desires? Well, all these desires are actually neutral in and of themselves, but they can be satisfied in good or sinful ways, but they don't go away. What are, what are some of the desires we have? Well, we have a desire for food, for security, for safety, for status, for belonging, for possessions, for friendship, for love, for intimacy, and many other things. So we have these desires that actually we're made in the image of God and we're made good with these desires. But if the deepest and the most intense experiences of human life are personal and to do with intimacy with other people, like when we're on our deathbeds, we're probably not going to be thinking, did I put the rubbish out? Did I get 89 or 90 on that test? We're going to be thinking about our loved ones, right? We're going to be thinking about our relationships. They, if relationships are the most kind of deepest part of our desires and, and relating to others, then how much more is the deepest desire actually a spiritual desire for relationship with our Creator who is also a person like no other. But as I said before, this desire, these deepest, all these desires have been distorted by the fall. And in fact, this deepest desire for God has become distorted by the fall. But here's the good news. When we're born again, when we become a Christian and we put our faith and trust and repent of our sins in Jesus, then God comes in and gives us a new heart. He actually changes our desires and gives us a love for God and a love for His people and His Word. Um, so, but before we're born again, before we come to know Christ, there is some semblance of a longing for God, but it's distorted by sin and it usually turns to idolatry instead. Now, if we don't have this love of God, if we haven't been born again and had God come and live inside of us, um, then we just have religion without genuine love, and we don't really know God. In fact, the Apostle John tells us this in 1 John 4, verse 7. He says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. So ultimately, this desire for God comes from Him. And we're made in His image, so that was what we're created to do. But when we become a Christian, instead of this longing for the spiritual or longing for God or this God-shaped hole in our heart you sometimes hear people talking about, instead of it being kind of turned into other things that aren't a personal relationship with God, other ways of meeting that spiritual um, vacuum. God gives us a new heart, a heart that desires and loves Him. And I love this truth. This is one of the greatest truths as a pastor, I think, or a leader in the church. Because you have a love for God. You want to read the Bible. You want to have Christian fellowship. You want to serve Him, right? And um, we don't need to try and, I don't know, um, bow, um, 
kind of force you into it. We don't need to kind of put the law on you because you actually, God has done the work. You have a desire for that. Now, there's lots of things that can disrupt that on the way. That we, that's why we need Christian community. But actually, God's put that love in your heart for him if you've put your trust in him and given your life to him. You see, without spiritual passion for the Christian life that only God can give, spirituality and living the Christian life is actually really hard work. And if we don't have God giving us that love for him and that passion, and we're just trying to do it all of our own strength, it can end up not only boring and hard work and church boring and reading the Bible boring, it can end up legalistic as well because we're just kind of going through the motions. Um, Think about hobbies. Think about the things you love to do. Take a moment, think about it, what pops into your mind. Um, there are things we're passionate about, but we have, we're under no obligation to do them, are we? Like as soon as we get bored of a particular hobby, um, we can drop them. Like I remember my brother, he'd have a new hobby every few weeks, right? He'd get excited about this and that and that, um, but there's no pressure. We can drop hobbies when we, when we get bored. But here's the interesting thing about hobbies. To do well in them, we have to, ironically, even though they're what, what we do to relax, we actually need to kind of work hard at them, usually, to kind of get good at them and really enjoy them, ironically enough. And maybe with the exception of watching movies, which is one of my favorite hobbies, um, we need actually some discipline to keep at them. But a question for you. What came first? The discipline to keep going at a hobby or the passion to do it in the first place? Which came first? It was the passion to do it. Something about that hobby, whether it was rock climbing or crafts or something captured your interest, didn't it? Something sparked within you and you kind of had this interest, this passion to actually do it. And then once you started doing it, you thought, wow, this is really fun. And you kept at it and you maybe had some goals and, and then it became more fun over time. At times frustrating, but fun, you know. Um, And likewise with God, we need him to arouse our spiritual passion, our spiritual curiosity, if you will, so that we desire him. And we actually end up enjoying, but also persisting at such things as reading the word, praying, coming to church each week, which is getting more and more challenging in our society. Like these, These are the things that we need God to give us a passion and a heart for. And if we don't have them, we can ask him because he more than wants to continue that process. When I talked about him coming in and giving us this passion for him, the love for him when we're born again, well, that's just the beginning, that's just the first step, the beginning of the process. And in fact, the whole of the Christian life is him as he lives in us, changing our heart and giving us more and more love for him, for others, and for those that don't know him. So... just, a, just an example of that. Um, I'm a bit of an enthusiast. You can probably tell already. Um, when, I was, when I was at high school, I got very enthusiastic about basketball because I, I did my growth spurt in third and fourth form, so they put me in the center position, but then I stopped growing, so eventually I kind of went down. I uh, went from the A team to the B team in my last year, which was pretty gutting, but I was determined to slam dunk, okay? I was determined that I one day would be able to, without a, without a trampoline, about a slam dunk, you know, that's when you, you just leap up with the ball in your hand and get it o- over the hoop. So that wasn't really happening. I won't say it's anything to do with my skin color, why I couldn't jump or anything like that, but I, I couldn't slam dunk, but I was like, I was going to make it happen. So I wore these big weights, like these, I, I heard that you can improve your vertical jump by wearing weights around your legs. So I bought these big ankle weights and put them under my school trousers and for about a month, I wore these weights around my legs while at high school and been mocked by all my friends and people that really weren't my friends for wearing these weights because I was determined to slam dunk. At the end of that period, after much mockery, I attempted to slam dunk and maybe I gained... A, no, I hadn't really gained anything at all, so I still couldn't slam dunk. But it was my passion for basketball, my passion to, see, to do this thing, slam dunk, that meant I persisted despite people not thinking it was cool and laughing at me and my friends thinking I was an idiot, which I was, um, that kind of kept me going. It was that passion, right? And it's exactly the same in the Christian life. 
There needs to be a curiosity. Now, we're going to talk about the hard times. There's times where we really don't feel like doing it, and we still do. But we still need that work of God in our hearts, giving us a desire for him and a a passion for the things of God. And that's why I think this is such an important topic you guys have been looking at over these weeks. So if a relationship with God is the most fundamental and deepest desire of a Christian, why does our desire for God often start strong when we get saved or have a fresh encounter with Him? But why does it tend to weaken over time? So now I'd like to look at why we don't desire God and when we do desire God. So beginning with when we don't desire God. So to help everyone like, why, why is it that we often start with this, you know, or we get a fresh encounter with God, or even when we first become a Christian, why is it that it starts strong and then tends to fade? Um, why don't we desire God, and why does our love for Him become lukewarm at times? So, we're going to do an exercise, and I want everyone to close their eyes if they could, and I'd like you to imagine your favorite food. Imagine your favorite food. For me, like I shared before, porterhouse steak, medium rare. I don't, something really different for you. Now, thank you for doing that exercise. I know this is quite a cruel exercise, but is anyone's mouth watering? <laughs> mine is. My, my mouth's watering, right? Um, I really want steak now. But um, isn't it interesting that, especially if you're me, but I'm sure with you, we're actually hungry all of the time. We're actually hungry a lot of the time. But because our minds aren't always thinking about food, or for most of us, we're not actually aware of our desire for food and our desire to eat. Except now there's, you're probably not going to think of anything else for the rest of the morning. But like our, because our focus is elsewhere, we're not aware of this desire for food. And it's the same with God. Like We all have this deep desire for Him, but it's not until we start to meditate on the object of, his, of our desire, which, and talking of spiritual desire, is it's not until we start meditating on who God is or reading his word that, that we're even aware of that desire. And in fact, it's only when we meditate on, on God that our desire, and we, we read his word, we serve him, we're part of community, that the desire actually grows. So we're not aware of this desperate need that we all have for him. However, If we fill our lives with other legitimate human desires, whether it's for praise and status among humans, whether it's for pleasure or possessions, but if desiring God is not central, then actually what happens is our our desire for God begins to become dulled. It begins to become less than it was. And another thing we can do is we can replace this desire for God, this spiritual hunger, Um, with other desires to try and fill up that void. And actually the parable, a parable of the sower that Jesus preached indicates this. As we read in Matthew 13, 22, Jesus says, the seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. So I believe one of the main ways that that desire for God starts to get dulled is when our, sh- our focus shifts. And sometimes even as Christians, we can start to even replace that hunger for God with a desire for other things. And that spiritual vitality gets choked, Jesus told us. As well as having our focus elsewhere, there are many other reasons we could look at why we stop desiring God. Just some things like we have a wrong understanding who, of who God is can really affect our relationship with Him. Like when we think God's Um, just out to get us, or on the flip side, we think he's just a divine vending machine or a big teddy bear to give us what we want. Those wrong views of God can affect, because we're not actually coming in real relationship with it. That can affect our desire for him. Um, Opposition from the world or the enemy um, can discourage us. Um, Unbelief, sin, there's many other things. But one thing I really felt to talk about this morning that I think really affects our desire for God is discouragement. Discouragement is a huge thing. And what does discouragement do? Well, it dulls our hunger because why? Because our, our kind of our eyesight, our eyes start to kind of look more and more down at our feet. We start to discouragement can't help but make us 
um, dwell on the past, dwell on that, that, that pain or that disappointment. And it starts to, and because that's our focus, and that starts to affect how we can connect with God. It starts to make us ask questions. Does God really care about me? Is that, is that really his plan for my life? And that starts to affect our desire for him. And we find, start to th- find the spiritual life hard. Just a story about that. When I was in my mid-twenties, I got a little bit cynical about the church. I call it my period of postmodern paralysis. Don't worry if you don't know what that means. But I was a very intellectual Christian and I wanted to figure everything out. And my faith, I still kept going to church. I never stopped going to church. But the Bible became more and more hard for me to read. I found it more and more boring, to be honest. Um, I kept at it, but it was, wasn't much fun. Um, and I suppose unbelief started to creep in, in my mind, a kind of a cynical a cynicism about church life. Um, and, but then I got to a point where I, this kind of hunger started again. And I started to, and the big question I started to ask myself was if God, the creator of the universe, actually lives inside of me, as his word says, if the Holy Spirit, I mean, think of this, right? This is what the Bible tells us. It says that the creator of all the universe, the infinite God, he lives inside of us. And I started to think, I know the Bible's true. I've always believed in in the Bible and God, but what is is this real? Is this does he really live inside of me? What evidence do I actually see that he lives inside of me? Right? I started to get really challenged by oh, I've been brought up in a, in a lovely church, but I didn't believe that a lot of the things that Jesus did in terms of healing and prophecy, all that stuff was for today. And I started to read the Bible and go, well, if he did all that back then, why isn't he doing that today? And it really challenged me, this question of if the Holy Spirit really lives inside of me, why don't I see more evidence? And this hunger for God started to get stirred up. So I went away, a thing I'd never done before, on a prayer retreat, and it was on top of this hill, and first time for an extended fast, and I got really tired walking up and down this hill and didn't know what I was doing. And I spent this whole kind of, quite a, quite a period of time, just took some time out to seek God, because I said, God, I want your reality in my life. I had very little experience um, with any, any of the things that I'd started reading in the Bible. I just started praying to God and saying, God, so I went away for um, a period, prayed, and nothing happened. I didn't have a great encounter with God, just nothing happened. And in fact, six months went by and nothing happened. But there was something in me that was just kept asking this question, God, if you live inside of me, why don't I see more evidence of it? You know, not, not just in terms of in terms of my life and how I'm living, but also in terms of things that you do, pr- answering prayer, these things. And after six months, I wasn't in a church service, I wasn't um, at a conference, but I was just in my room one night, and I had an encounter with God that literally changed my life. For th- I'm not a super experiential person, so I don't usually feel a lot, but, but I felt God's presence like I'd never felt before. I felt his liquid, lo- like liquid love and his, this joy that I'd never experienced before. I'd never done drugs, so I don't know what that's like, but, but it was like, whoa, this joy I'd never experienced, and this liquid love. And it felt like God went from a million miles away to right here. Um, suddenly he was here, and, and I was so excited. And after that, I got the privilege of praying for someone, and they got healed. And that was just the most exciting thing for me. I'd been kind of taught that that wasn't for today, and I was so excited. The next 20 people didn't get healed, but um, I didn't care. I just kept going, right? It was like this. I, you know, some people, I'm, I'm an optimist, right? I'm just like, wow, a person got healed. I'm not put off by um, when things don't happen. Not too much. If it keeps happening, it's, it's hard. But yeah, I was just so excited. And um, yeah, that's when I think things changed for me. So as we wrap up, when I want to look at when we, when we do desire God. When do we grow in our desire for God? We can see which desires we're spending most of our time fulfilling and growing in when we look at what we do with our, you know, our spare time, I suppose. And I don't know about you, but I find it easy to um, be doing lots of things, lots of good things in themselves, 
but it's, it's easy to push aside that personal time with God. Let's read Psalm 42, 1 to 2 again, where the psalmist describes just how much he desired God. He said, As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? So that desire for God can be met if we meet him in that time with him during our week. And it can be met in a church service when we gather together in a different but very special way. Um, And the psalmist, he had a holy desperation for God. And a man or woman who strongly desires something is going to live a radical life. And a man or woman that lives has a strong desire for God is going to live a radical life. And why is it that we're allowed to be radically committed to making money or being famous in society, I mean, um, or getting promoted at work or even developing amazing relationships, but if we're radically committed to pursuing God and desiring Him, it's seen as fanaticism, seen as, seen as crazy. Um, but as important as recreation, as important as our careers and developing a great family life is, these are not the deepest desires of our hearts and are not the great integrating love that actually brings all these things into balance and gives them eternal meaning. This deepest integrating desire is to love God. That's what actually brings all those other desires into right alignment, so they can be fulfilled in godly ways, and so they find their proper place. Now, those other desires, for all those great things we talked about before, they're not replaced or overshadowed. We don't all become hermits and go to the mountains and just seek God, right? That's not what it's about. They actually find, when we love and desire God, we become whole, and we actually operate in the way we're designed to. I mean, the Bible says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So his other desires get fulfilled in a way that's the way God intended, which is awesome. Um, So as a a result of our our deepest desire is for God, Um, Augustine expressed it like this. He said, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it finds its rest in you. So what I love about this and what I love about your church, actually, is when a group of people start to hunger and thirst for God, when they start to desire Him to to move in their midst and start to desire to see Him move in their community, and they turn that into all the ways that they're gifted and wired to do that, whether it's praying together, praying at home, seeking Him in different ways, something happens. God looks at that hunger, looks at that desire, and He starts to move. I had the incredible privilege of being um, part of a young adults community where that happened. Kind of, I was the young adults pastor of an 18 to 30s kind of age group. And over time, we saw God move. We saw um, many people in that group were new Christians because we went out and shared our faith on the street and in other ways. And they became Christians and lives were transformed. And then um, those people that were new Christians were so excited, they invited all their family, all their friends, and then they became Christians, and we got to see our group grow through people coming to faith. It was so incredible. We got to see God do incredible miracles. And as things started, this kind of rather than a vicious cycle where discouragement leads to people less and less wanting committee and less and want, wanting to be part of it, because awesome things were happening, people just got more and more encouraged, right? More and more hungry for God and became more and more expectant. Like I remember after... Um, a big um, Easter, a young adults, not the, not the Easter camp for youth, but we had a big um, Easter camp after a big time where God really moved. Um, one of the leader's brothers, who wasn't a Christian, came on the Monday night when we had our group, and he came and he was completely blind in one eye. He had an eye patch, um, and he had bandages and stitches in, in his eyeball, and he had been walking down one of the streets in the CBD and a bus had gone over a bottle, and all the glass had gone in his eye, and he was completely blind. And they were going to actually have to remove the eyeball eventually, because it wasn't going well. Um, but he came to our group. But there was this hunger for God amongst those young adults. There was this, because they started to see God move, there was this expectation. So after um, the different small groups that met, a group of them just started praying for him for like 5, 10, 15 minutes. I went upstairs 
when, when they were doing this. And then suddenly, this, this man said, something's happened. And he took that eye patch off, and the bandage and stitches, the bandage that was over his eye and the stitches that were in his eyeball had disappeared, vaporized, bent up to heaven. I don't know what had happened to them. And he could see. He had, um, God had healed his blind eye. And he went back to the specialist, and the specialist tested his vision, and he, he, he actually had 20-20 vision out of both eyes. Before the, ex, before the accident, before we prayed for him, he needed glasses, but God actually restored his vision in both eyes and, and recreated his eye. And that was, and I came up at the end, I wasn't a lot to do with that, but there was just this hunger amongst this group of young adults and this expectation as they stepped out, as we persisted through the difficult times where not much happened, this Hunger grew amongst them, and this expectation. Um, yeah, and one last story before I finish is I just want to encourage you that one of my favorite parables, because it's one I've had to take to heart, is the parable of the persistent widow, right? She was prepared to just keep bugging that, that unjust judge. It's one of the, you can look it up, one of Jesus' parables. No matter what, she just was like a bulldog. She just wouldn't give up. And that's the kind of grittiness we need to our hunger for God and willingness to keep stepping out. Even, like I said, 20 people didn't get healed. I don't know the exact number, but roughly after the first person I prayed for did. It's easy to, it's easy to give up. Um, and, and often the way God moves with us is he doesn't pour it all out continuously all the time, right? He often comes in waves. He comes in the move of his spirit and waves. Um, and often when we least expect it, like one time I got asked, me and a friend got asked to minister at a YWAM base, and I'd had a, like a super busy week, no time to pray, and been um, falling into a little bit of religion. I thought, oh well, I haven't had any time to pray, probably not much is going to happen, go and share different things, and then we'll go home, it's cool. So yeah, went out there with my friend, we both were sharing different things, equipping them how to share their faith, and and, and pray for people and different things. And at the end of it, oh, actually in the middle of it when we are having lunch, my friend who was an evangelist, um, he, he'd seen many people come to the Lord in quite radical ways, in quite Holy Spirit powerful ways. Um, one of the girls there suddenly realized as we are just sharing how to, what, the, what the gospel was, that she wasn't a Christian, that she'd gone through the motions of Christianity and never really been born again. And my friend said it was one of the most radical conversions he'd seen. She, just, like, she was just crying and crying, and then just those tears turned to joy. And just her, her whole face changed as she came into a real radical and living relationship with Jesus. But, so that happened over the lunch break. But at the end, um, I, I just offered, I shared some stories, and just offered if anyone would like prayer. Now, I wish to say this would happen every time I do this, but this is what happened this, this weekend. Um, I offered to pray. The first person that came up, um, I can't remember what it was, but just something happened. Like the presence of God just came there, and the first person got healed. Suddenly, some people started to look, and, whoa, something's going on. They got healed. Someone came in with arthritis all through their hands. Um, at first, nothing happened. Prayed a second time. Suddenly, they were like, whoa, it's, it's like killed. They had it for many years. There was no arthritis, no pain at all. Someone else came up, and she had had a really, like, she could hardly... For years and years, whenever she ate things, she just felt really, really sick all the time in her stomach, and she really ruined her enjoyment for food and life. Um, and as we prayed, there was, a, there was a demonic thing there that we had to pray, get rid of that. And for the first time, for years and years, she felt like just perfect. Her stomach felt perfect. Um, and God gave me a word that her, that her grandmother also had the same thing that I didn't know, and sure enough, she did, and that God said, felt like he was saying that she was getting free as well. Um, and then <laughs> everyone was getting prayer. The only person, someone came with glasses and said, I don't want glasses anymore. That was the only thing that didn't get healed that morning. But someone else came and they were, um, had, a, had a, rib, a rib cage that had been kind of, um, had grown wrong when they were born. So it was kind of distorted and it was causing lots of kind of problems. And they were missing a rib. Um, and as I got some girls to lay hands on her rib and then I laid my hands on, on their hands. And as we prayed, that rib cage moved about, and the rib that was missing was recreated then and there as we prayed. <laughs> and the, everyone was just going nuts. They were just so excited, especially the girl was just 
freaking out in, in a good way. Um, and that was, I was not expecting anything to happen. Now, I don't want to give you the um, impression that that happens every time I pray for people because it really doesn't. But that was just a little sign to me of the kingdom to come, of God's presence. When, when a group of people or individuals persist through those times where we don't experience that, where people don't get healed, where we pray and nothing seems to happen, that was a little taste of the kingdom to come. That was a taste of what it's... Um, of heaven, I suppose, for me. And just like the psalmist in Psalm 42, when I remember those times where God's moved in my life, but also through me to other people, that brings back that hunger for me. And I want to, if the worship team could come up, it would be awesome. For you, I think it's the same. If you even now, as we're worshiping, start to remember those times where, where you had just your white hot for Jesus, or God was moving, then that will help, that will help you um, stir up that afresh, that hunger for him as well. And certainly when I was preparing this, this talk and thinking about the times in my life where I was hungry for God, and I think I still am, but when I was really hungry for God and I was really stepping out as a result, um, it freshly encouraged me to grow in that hunger, which is the deepest desire of our heart. I mean, Jeremiah 29, 13 says, you'll seek me when you, fi- when you sorry, you'll, and find me when you seek me with all your heart. And as the psalmist put it, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. So let's stand and let's worship. Mm-hmm.